Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let's do identity part two um, from basically chimpanzees to the modern world. We're going to cover a big span here tonight. First, I want to say that the uh, June class is completely filled. Uh, so that one's sold out. So if you're interested in taking the class, um, <clears throat> the September classes still have some space available. So you can check those out on my website. I'm going to put a video up about the classes here pretty soon. Um, and if you could only make it in June, like September's out completely, let me know and I can put you on a waiting list uh, in case something happens and we get a, a space available. So otherwise, uh, it's September all the time. And thanks to everybody who has signed up and, and waved their hand for, uh, for June. I appreciate that. And to the people who signed up for September as well, of course. Um, yeah. All right. So identity part two. So now last time talked a lot about chimpanzees and the formation of our identity within that structure. But of course, we are not chimpanzees. We are homo sapiens sapiens, um, evolved primates uh, of a different variety. And some of the key features of the human evolution <clears throat> and what's key to our success has been cooperation. And so when you look at other primate species, we cooperate at a, at a level that's just amazing. You know, people talk about language, et cetera, but really, you know, sort of friendship, cooperation, empathy, these sorts of group forming capacities really define a lot of what humans are about. And we'll talk about more about this. Some, some people say, you know, we're closer to the bonobos who tend to be often much friendlier. And so that's fine. Another primate group. And you know, you can compare and contrast and with, with different uh, primate groups, and there's a lot to be learned there. This is why I started with that kind of information. But it's important to note that, in fact, we are distinct, and we can only learn so much. Although, boy, there's a lot of times when I just think, wow, we're just, we're just living with chimpanzees. However, we're not just chimpanzees. We're chimpanzees plus, or perhaps minus, depending on how you want to think about it. But I'll go with chimpanzees plus. The extraordinary thing about humanity is, <clears throat> excuse me, depending on when you want to, you know, say 200,000 years ago or so, you know, pick your date exactly when the, the split starts and everything, you know, uh, starts to move f towards where we are today. You know, that one, there are very few of us at this time, so there may be 30, 50,000, 100,000, you know, numbers very hard to track this down that rapidly, very rapidly, spread throughout the entire world. So, you know, 10,000 years ago, um, humans are present almost everywhere. I don't think Polynesia had yet been settled. Um, the, and I think some of the more remote icy places like Iceland and Greenland had yet to be settled. But basically, 90% of the earth has human presence <clears throat> by 10,000 years, which is an extraordinarily rapid spread um, by, by our ancestors. And what's key to understand here is this spread took place in small groups. So, you know, again, these numbers are rough. It's hard to figure out exactly what uh, the numbers are, but no one's really exactly sure, but say about 10,000 years ago, sort of the advent of Af Af uh, <clears throat> excuse me, agriculture, there was something between a million to 10 million people on the planet. Okay, so, you know, what, what those numbers are exactly. Let's just, if we just pick the middle, let's say 5 million. But those 5 million people are distributed from South America, Central America, North America, uh, Asia, Africa, Europe. I mean, they're everywhere, <clears throat> which means that the population density that humans were living uh, in during this several hundred thousand year period of cultural and social evolution was very small, very low. Uh, again, number exactly not clear what the number is, but turns out that we're not great at tracking more than 100, maybe 150 people. <clears throat> it's something around that number that we're able to track pretty clearly. When we get past 100, 150 people, we get confused. We don't remember who people are. We just ignore them. We can't track them which suggests kind of strongly that probably most of our ancestors lived in communities a hundred people or smaller. And certainly before the agricultural revolution, this was the case for almost everyone. <clears throat> One note there of caution that I would like to point out is um, the sea level used to be much lower 
Um, uh, 50,000 years ago, it was dramatically lower, but even again, 10,000 years ago, sea level was about 100 feet, give or take, lower than it is today. Why does this matter? <clears throat> well, it matters because many of the early societies, of course, would have been on the seashores and riversides where rivers run into oceans or, or, or generally very rich for all kinds of foodstuffs and, and opportunities to harvest uh, fish and shellfish. So if you look at today, contemporary where I live in the Pacific Northwest, you know, the, the many of the Salish Sea uh, native uh, tribes based their entire cultural history and living in these sorts of uh, bioregions where they're where they have the salmon runs and they have the coastal fishing and the selfish gathering. And this provides a incredibly rich food opportunity, but it also means you don't have to be particularly nomadic. You're not moving. So you're hunting and gathering, you know, often tends to include semi nomadic moving from region to region, but they're, they're able to be moderately settled because the, of the stability of the food supply when you're in that river coastal intersection. So because a sea level has risen so much in the last 10,000 years, what we need to remember is probably a lot of the evidence for those early groups is gone, right? We're not finding it. It doesn't mean it wasn't there. So it is possible that the population used to be larger. And it's also possible that there were larger gatherings in these particular locations that were, you know, very rich in, in food. However, uh, the evidence seems pretty clear that probably most of our ancestors, most of the time, lived in small, semi-nomadic hunting-gathering bands. And then you get, of course, the big agricultural revolution. And there seems to be a lot of, you know, argument, disputation about, well, <clears throat> is the agricultural revolution good? Is it bad? Did we live better before? Did we live better after? And I think, you know, one way to think of it is that it's just different, right? That the kinds of aspects of humanity that could express themselves when we're in semi-nomadic small groups is different from the aspects of humanity that could express themselves when we're in much larger settled communities, a few thousand, 10,000 till today, you know, millions, uh, which is crazy to even think about. How, how, do we, how do we make that transition so quickly? But certainly it was a dramatic change in the way people lived and it happened relative to evolution or biological changes relatively quickly. <clears throat> and people do note that when you make that change that people tended to get smaller, which suggested their diets were probably less good. Um, and they tend to live less time, probably related to disease and the fact that you're going to be subject to periodic famine because agriculture, early agriculture was very, very prone to failure. So that's sort of the downside of the switch to agriculture. The upside, of course, is it allowed for specialization and for the pursuit of human capacities that are difficult to realize when you're in small semi-nomadic groups. <clears throat> and that change is kind of where we live today. We live with the outcome of the agricultural revolution. So it's good to look back to the other, and we're certainly going to talk about that, but also remember that this is a change that's sort of baked in now as we try to ponder the human experience and how we form identity. So if we go back to the early hunting gathering tribal structure, um, small group again, they tended to be relatively egalitarian as far as we can tell from the archaeological record, which makes sense because anthropology has demonstrated this was often the case as well, not invariably, but often the case even with modern hunting gathering tribes that survived into the modern era. And, you know, they didn't acquire a lot of stuff because if you're moving around, you couldn't carry a lot of stuff. And so they were focused very differently in their ideas and outlooks. For our sake, and when you can think about identity, the important thing to notice here is <clears throat> probably you never worried about your identity. If you're born into a group of, say, 60 or 70 people, you know everyone your entire life. You know how you relate to them. I mean, it's just that simple. There's no, there's not a lot of confusion. You're not, you don't have the opportunity or the problem of having to worry about, quote, quote, who, who am I and what should I be doing? You know who you are and you know what you should be doing because everybody in the tribe is kind of counting on you to participate and to help the group survive. And the anthropological, anthropological research and the research that's been done on hunter-gathering tribes and archaeological research suggest 
that, you know, they had a lot of leisure time. Um, they didn't work all that much to survive. And while this is true, I think it's important to notice that it's intermittent, right? That, that if you go out and hunt and you come back with nothing, okay. If you go out and hunt and you come back with nothing, okay, now we're in trouble. You go out and hunt and you come back with nothing and now we're starving. And many early hunter-gathering troops, and indeed, again, where I am in the Pacific Northwest, had periodic starvation just because of the natural cycle. And in the Pacific Northwest, they actually call it the, one of the, a couple of the tribes call it um, the hungry season, because they knew there was this time between um, salmon runs <clears throat> and the fish that are running on the coast in the salt water going, ooh, you know, there's that gap, deer are gone. Salmon haven't showed up in spring yet. Uh, you know, it gets sketchy. And so that notion that, yeah, you're not doing a lot of work, but you are still very subject to the forces of, of nature meant that you had to cooperate to survive. Cooperation was the survival skill par excellence. And the fact that we're so spread out <clears throat> suggests that anytime a group got too large, it would have to divide because it wasn't able to support itself without, you know, having settled agriculture, which then would kick off the agricultural revolution. And so, you know, your identity as a member of the group was totally and completely defined. And it's pretty clear that people who created problems or who wouldn't cooperate would either be kicked out of the group, which is generally a death sentence, or they would be murdered, right? That they would, they would get upset and they would kill you because you're just being too problematic, right? We, we cannot afford to carry people who are not being cooperative. So sort of friendship, family bonds, social bonds were everything. I mean, this is what your world was. And again, looking back to the chimpanzees, they spend so much of their time involved in systems that reinforce um, their position within the tribe and makes friendship, family bonds, that is also our heritage, except for to a very much larger degree. We have to cooperate to survive. It, is, it was probably the key evolutionary advantage we have that allowed us to you know, populate the entire planet in 10,000, well, by 10,000 AD, we're, we're, I mean, by 10,000 BC, we're pretty much everywhere. An extraordinary quick spread to incredibly diverse bioregions over amazingly long distance. Why? Because we were organized and we were cooperative. And that is an, um, just an immense advantage from a competition standpoint. So that undergirding, you know, foundation then runs into agriculture. And the transition, of course, you know, positive, negative, whatever it is, a historical fact, <clears throat> created a much greater emphasis on hierarchy. Now, why that is controversial, but it seems necessary because you see it pretty much everywhere where you get large-scale agricultural societies. You get tend to see very large tendencies towards hierarchy and the reinforcing of hierarchy to organize society and often enforced by violence. So, <clears throat> you know, a big change from being a small-scale, primarily cooperative maybe friend reciprocation based social unit to large cooperative environments, but enforced by violence and strongly hierarchical rather than egalitarian. <clears throat> so once you get specialization, you know, how do you decide who do, does what and how do you start? So all of a sudden, wow, these questions start to come to the fore. But what's important to note is you really still don't get that much of a question about identity <clears throat> because for most of human history, and I mean most of human, like say till 1700-ish or so, say 10,000 if you rough whatever the date is for the beginning of the agricultural revolution, pick your date, to 1700-ish, probably 80% of humanity was some sort of slave, serf, peasant who was the equivalent of a slave, you know, uh, under the direct and total control of their superiors, of, of whoever was running the show at threats of violence. So what does this mean for the time for most of the population from, you know, say zero to 1700? It means a couple of millennia, at least, maybe more, 
where for 80% plus of the population, again, your identity is totally 100% completely established by your environment. Now, it's a different kind of identity because, again, not egalitarian and reciprocating uh, primarily, but hierarchical in theory. Um, so you're in much larger units. Your conception of the world is going to be different. However, you're still probably working in smaller groups and you're working cooperatively. I mean, this is why, you know, the, the concept of the village and the work commune and, you know, our, our desire to, to break ourselves apart into smaller groups within larger structures has not gone away. That's still there. And so, but now it's an organized hierarchy and you have these uh, impositions from outside. What does this mean for identity? Well, first, you knew who you were because basically the legal codes, I mean, Hammurabi has this and the Code of Hammurabi has all kinds of issues about, you know, if you commit a crime to, in, against a slave, that's a different kind of punishment than if it's a free man, which is a different kind of punishment. If it's a nobility, it's a different kind of punishment if it's a priest. So you're already getting these, you know, hierarchical arrangements. And, you know, if you kill a slave, well, you just give somebody a couple of, you know, a piece of silver or something. If you kill a free man, well, now you're in trouble. If you kill a noble, noble well, we're just going to cut your head off and burn your house down and bad things are going to happen to you. So, you know, the value of human life is variable. But you knew who you were because it was imposed from the outside. I mean, you, of course, you have internal social structure as well. <clears throat> and again, so generally, it's who, where you live, that's going to be determined. Free movement is not a concept really in the history. I mean, it's hard for us to imagine <clears throat> because we take so much of this for granted, but you knew where you're going to live because if you left that area, you would be killed. I talked about this in an, an earlier lecture where I said, look, you know, to travel used to be a big deal because once you left the confines of whatever your hierarchical structure was you would be, you're, you're free to kill. There's no rep repercussions. No one is going to enforce a law against that. So you had to have some sort of protection or identity or recognition that made it safe for you to travel, which is often sketchy in the ancient world. <clears throat> so next, you're going to know who can you communicate with? Who are your equals? Well, that's also laid out by the law. So if you're a peasant or a slave or a serf, Okay. You can have a social structure within your peasant, slave, or serf community, but you knew where you were in the hierarchical order. Um, men and women tend to be very different, although it's in the ancient world, it's not clear how totally different this was because the, the laws seem to be much more specific, particularly because almost everybody's a slave and a serf. Those laws tended to just identify you as slave or serf. They didn't seem to be nearly as gendered. Now, when you get higher up in some of the ancient law codes, it was clear that, oh, yeah, we're going to distinguish between a noble woman and a noble man. But slave and serf seemed often almost gender irrelevant or, or, or neutral. So that's an interesting distinction. However, you, know, you still have strong gender distinction amongst the upper and middle classes. If you can think of them that way, it's probably an incorrect use of the term. But, you know, the, the aristocracy, the ruling elite, and then sort of the profession professional merchant classes tended to have different freemen, different standing. So uh, where you live, you know, what you know, there's no general education. So you're generally pretty ignorant of everything besides what's being told to you. Um, who you can live with, this is very heavily prescribed. And then, of course, what you can do to have the opportunity to learn a new trade or a new skill, you know, this is one of the things that's recorded throughout history as being this amazing breakthrough, like, oh, you know, somehow we got lucky and we were able to get our son apprentice to a baker. And so, wow, this like completely expanded the opportunities of the family. Of course, family was core here, family, family, family. Your cooperative unit was not the larger tribe, but now it's family. So if you had anything opportunity to do, it was to look after uh, those who your children and your parents and your aunts and your uncles, this was the unit you cared about. This was life and death. If when starvation came and starvation was going to come, who might feed you? Probably your family. That's what you were counting on. So your identity was prescribed by who you were born to, who you were born with, where you were born, and, you know, sort of everything followed from that. 
And again, even the higher classes, like people, so you know, military generals and these, I mean, these guys were in trouble pretty much. I mean, they are, if you read the ancient text, they're getting killed all the time, right? Oh, leader thinks he's a threat, now cut his head off. Oh, you know, I think he's plotting with somebody else, we'll cut, cut their head off, kill their family, exile everybody. And so that sense of security, like, oh, okay, if you're one of the leaders, you're in pretty good shape, ah, tended to be a unstable dangerous kind of world for much of ancient history. And soldiers, again, did not have it very well. Merchants were the only ones that tended to travel around very much, particularly uh, uh, ocean-going merchants. And so everybody was suspicious of them because they're like, well, where do they come from? Who are they? Where are they going? Where are they going to be tomorrow? So again, ancient texts are universally suspicious of merchants because People don't know them, and they're afraid that they might be leaving, and they don't know where they're going. Where everybody else in your community, you know they were here yesterday, they're going to be here today, and unless they die, they're going to be here tomorrow. So this incredible sense of living in a stable world that goes on forever. My favorite example of this is throughout history, like even our concept of history is um, new, um, the ancient Egyptians would, and this was true throughout all kinds of chronicles. They used to do chronicles. They would give a battle to five or six successive pharaohs. Right? Oh, that pharaoh won the battle of Aptos. And then two pharaohs later, it'd be that pharaoh won the battle of Aptos. Or that king conquered the city of Jephthah. And then a couple of generations later, that king was the conqueror of the city of Jephthah. And it's like, whoa. Wait a second, this is a completely different king. You know, this is generations later. How can it be the same king? You know, it can't be by our conception of history. But if you live in a world where everything is stable, everything you, everybody you know, you've always known, very few new people come and go. You know, there's no technological change. I mean, it's, it's, it's an unbelievably slow pace. The occasional war or apocalyptic famine comes through and disrupts things that you understand. The world is dangerous and unstable, but your sense of the human is this unchanging, moderately chaotic, permanent presence. And so the, the, the way they chronicle time is not the way we even think about time, not of this sequence of change, but of the cyclical nature of it always is the same. Right? It was cyclical, and it's always the same. It's not going someplace. It's not developing. It's not changing. It's just doing its cycle. It's spring now. It'll be summer. It'll be summer now. It'll be winter. Winter, and then it'll be spring again. That's the cycle. But they thought of, <clears throat> they tended to think of everything in these terms. It's one reason astrology was so hugely popular in the ancient world. It's because everything is in cycles. And you're, if you think about the world in cycles, not as history developing or moving or changing, then you don't, you know, what you want to th look at is map anything you see that's cyclical onto the world to understand it because it doesn't change. It just cycles. It's a sort of frozen <clears throat> in its pattern and it's just going to go on forever. And that was sort of the lived experience of people. They, they didn't get out and about. They didn't know what's going on. <clears throat> and so you have this unbelievably stable, Although chaotic, I know that sounds sort of paradoxical. You know, wasn't they weren't subject to raids and again famines and plagues and all these other things. These all came through, but the way they were experienced is yes, these come through and then they go away, and these come through and they go away. This is the way the world is. It's cyclical. It's not developing. It's not changing. It will never be any different. It's in this sort of you know organic stasis. Your position with that world equally is also fixed. This is the concept. Like you are who you are. You've known everybody around you for your whole life. You've never been anywhere. You don't travel. The semi-nomadic hunter-gatherers moved around much more. One can just you think about that. Much, much, much more than agrarian people 3,000 years later who are, you know, serfs were by law had to be on the land uh, peasants usually by law were tied to the land. Slaves, of course, tied to wherever their location was. <clears throat> and so even the freedom of movement that our early hunter-gatherer ancestors had has been decreased dramatically. 
So the theoretical scale of our society has expanded dramatically. <clears throat> However, our experience of it is that it's actually become smaller and more densely populated. So that is the kind of uh, interesting change. So it's not geographically, it's a much smaller space and his, no sense of history, no sense of change. Um, and basically you are in a fixed position for 90, 80, 90% of the population. This begins to change, of course, as you get increasing specialization, increasing education, and increasing development of all of the, you know, quote unquote, uh, elements of civilization that expand the possibility of human existence. But it's important to remember that for almost all of human history, almost for almost all of the, since the agricultural revolution, when you start getting this specialization, that was only available to an extraordinarily limited number of people. And so mostly people still lived in a world where cooperating, uh, staying in your place and trying to get along was the key to survival in a different way than the hunter gatherers, but still that was the core of it with this layer of hierarchy, threat, danger, and of course, famines and plagues added in just to make the whole thing more fun. Now, when does this start to change? Wow, that is tough. Uh, you know, again, it's one of these, what are the origins of things? But, you know, you can look at something like ancient Rome, where you get sufficient population density for, for this, for, for all kinds of specializations, for basically the Roman citizen. There were enough Roman citizens who were able to take enough resources from the empire, uh, for the Republic and then the empire for, a dramatic expansion and the opportunity for individuals to express themselves. And of course, what do you get? You get, you know, examples of individuals expressing themselves. Same things happens in Athens, relatively small population, but was able to support a sufficient number of educated, uh, useless aristocracy that they came up with stuff like philosophy, right? Sort of what a waste of time uh, that is. So those sorts of opportunities start to spring up all over the world in isolated spots. And, you you know, in China is doing this. Korea is doing this. <clears throat> you know, the Aztecs and Incas in the New World. There, you know, all of your great flourishings of civilization um, begin to arise. But still, you know, 80, 90 percent of the population, ignorant slaves under legal and, um, you know, military sanction against participating or changing uh, what they're doing or how they behave or who they're allowed to talk to or how they're supposed to dress or where they're allowed to travel and so on. And it's only really, I mean, again, where do you draw the line? Where do you say, when does this start to become more widespread? And it seems to be, you know, it varies in different countries at different times, but as the agricultural revolution begins to expand more quickly, where agricultural practices begin to improve. So in China, when you get the, because rice, you can grow so many calories per acre of rice. And when they improve the irrigation, then you could get a stable growing capacity for people to participate um, in the society and not just be serfs and not just be slaves. But it's important to remember that's only been in like the last hundred years that slavery has generally been illegal in most of the world. I think it's an illegal in all of the world today. But that's how pervasive it was throughout the world and throughout history. Only for the last hundred or two hundred years have most of the human population been able to take advantage of many of the aspects of quote unquote civilization. <clears throat> so, however, once that starts to happen, once you start to get to see this fluorescence of um, people with a little more freedom, with enough excess material wealth and with enough legal structure that allows them to express some of this, what do you get immediately? Uh, you start getting identity anxiety. It comes with the territory. Now, again, if you have kings, generals, a few wealthy merchants, peasants, you don't have a problem. Everybody knows who they are. They aren't nervous about this. Once it starts to get a little more fragmented than that, we start to run into trouble. 
also when you have to start dealing with strangers. Then it starts getting in trouble because when, with identity, remember from the first lecture, I said identity is not just my sense of who I am. It's my sense of who I am in relationship to my community. When I meet a stranger, I have two problems. One, I don't know who they are. And they don't know who I am. And so how do I establish a sense of who I am if they're a stranger, right? If I can say, oh, I'm like all the names that, you know, John's son, all the names, and then, you know, John's son, I'm John's son. Well, if you don't know John, this is an incredibly unhelpful rubric for telling people who you are. But because you lived in a world where everybody knew John, being John's son answered that question immediately. Oh, I've never met you, but of course I've heard about you. Or I saw you a few years ago and you're younger, now you're older, oh, you're John's son. Done, done. But we're not worried about that. We can identify everybody. Now you start introducing strangers. And, and we usually think of strangers of going, oh, well, who are they? Right, which is perfectly reasonable, one way to think about it. But for identity, remember this also raises the immediately problem of how do I let them know who I am. <clears throat> and if you read the uh, Odyssey, which is everybody should read the Odyssey anyway, but one of the things that Odysseus has to keep doing in there is trying to figure out a how he should present himself because he's often in situations where it might not be that great to be known as Odysseus. But, you know, how do I let people know who I am? And then people are like, well, we have to tell you who we are. So they tend to have banquets. There's all this, oh, we've got a stranger. Let's have a banquet. So they introduce the stranger to the banquet. It's like, what is the point of that? Why don't you just ask him who you are and you tell us? Ah, if you have a banquet, then the, the stranger sits there and looks around and says, oh, I know who the people in charge are. I know who the queen and king are. I know who the number two person is. I know how much wealth they have because, look, I'm at this huge banquet. I can see that they have 20 servants and there's this spread of food and they'll tell me who they are and they'll introduce the guests. And, I, and by the time the banquet is done, I've got the lay of the land. And now they know that the strangers, say me, now they know that I know who they are. Then they tend to ask, Oh, and by the way, who are you? Now that you know who we are, because you've just seen it, you've just experienced, you've had a palpable uh, taste, literally of the food, but also of, of the, the, the view of this. Now, who are you? But if you don't have the opportunity to do that, the stranger then unnerves your position. How is it they're supposed to how am I supposed to let them know? And what if I get two strangers? What if I get three strangers? And so all kinds of different protocols are developed to deal with this. Of course, dress being the most obvious, most beautiful, most wonderful example of this is people start dressing appropriate to specific trades so that people can identify them immediately and go, I don't know who you are but I know you're a wheelwright because you're wearing a green coat with white trousers or something. And that's, the, 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 that's what wheelwrights wear. Or I see that you're wearing a red hat. That means you're from the palace. You might be the lowest servant in the palace, but only people from the palace are allowed to wear red hats. So when I see you, I go, ah. So it's sort of the development and advent of the uniform. And the uniform tells you who strangers are. So you don't need uniforms if you don't see people, if, if you don't encounter strangers. You only need uniforms when you encounter strangers. It's one of these odd things where we think, oh, you know, uh, why, why, why does it matter how we dress? Well, it matters how you dress because if you encounter strangers, it does. If you don't encounter strangers, it really doesn't. This is why people tend to be much more casual at home than they are in public. Because at home, people know you. Like, oh, I'm just going to my friend's house. I don't have to get dressed up. Oh, if I'm going someplace professional where I don't know other professionals, uh, you can have casual dress Friday at work because in theory, everybody knows you at work. But if you don't know everybody at work, you don't have casual dress go meet the client's day. 
oh, just wear your pajamas and go meet the clients. No, first time you meet the client, you don't want to be wearing your pajamas, right? That's sort of, so when you're meeting strangers, this is where uniforms become important. And so, again, throughout history, as soon as you get these hierarchical societies, you get all these codes about who can wear what, particularly around colors and sashes and so on. Why? So that we could identify people. So we, we don't know them personally. So now we need uniforms to identify them. And so dress and this kind of identification becomes core to who you are. But think about this again. This is identity is opposed on you. People aren't asking you what do you want to wear. You're being told how you will dress, usually under legal and, you know, the strictures of, of, of punishment. Um, and one of the horror, you know, we think about this as horrifying that, you know, they used to make Jews wear, uh, this throughout history, they, they used to make, you know, Jews wear the, the yellow triangle or whatever it was. But that was true throughout history of everybody. Right. Every religion had to do something. If you were in a cosmopolitan city where different religions existed side by side, generally they had to be self-identified. They could wear a fez or you could wear a particular kind of jacket or the yam. You, know, you had to have something so everybody could look at you and go, oh, you're one of those people. You're one of those people. You're one of those people. And so, again, identity was not voluntary. It was imposed and it was necessary as far as the societies were uh, concerned for the f safe and effective functioning of the culture. Now, wow, what a transformation we live in, right? But we, we miss this, that every time one of these things changes, like, so for instance, oh, you know, you have a wider range of choice in how you dress. Ah, if I'm perceived by strangers, this is going to create problems both for me and for them. And this is what's coming. This is what begins to develop out of this. So one of the early things you'll get, continuing with the notion of dress, is they try to regulate what people wear. But once you start getting a pretty largish, particularly merchant middle class, um, you know, and often it's like, oh, I want to wear more lace ruffles, right? So you get those hilarious pictures where they have those huge lace ruffles. Well, that was an expression of wealth and power. And so the bigger they were, the wealthier and power, the more powerful you were. So they just tend to get really big. But it was also a way of skirting certain regulations about who could wear what. And so, you know, you're trying to express yourself. How do you express yourself? One way is with dress. And so right from the get-go, once you start getting even a little bit of excess wealth and possibility, you start pressing against these boundaries. But that's where it comes from. And so before the next lecture, I want to start at what happens when those boundaries start to fall down, which is the world in which we live. But it's important to understand from the beginning is that, hey, for what, say, 200,000 years, we were in small groups, 100, maybe 150 maximum, semi-nomadic hunter-gatherers, again, ex except with the caveat that I do think the sea level rise may throw that off. There may have been larger settlements. But anyway, let's just go with what the archaeological record supports uh, at the moment. <clears throat> and then, you know, we make the switch to agriculture, which on one hand changes a lot. I mean, it really changes a lot, but it doesn't free the individual up. I mean, we weren't really free to be individuals um, in small tribal societies, semi-nomadic tribal societies, because everybody is there in a group working together. You know, your individuality is cool and everything, and you've got leisure time, but we're all here trying to survive. Don't mess up or we'll kill you. Don't, don't, don't vary too much. Into a transition over time, of course, as now, but overnight, into agrarian societies where now we're hierarchical, but similarly tend to both the the... People on top, people in the middle, people on the bottom, the priests, all heavily regulated what they could do, what they could wear, who they could see, where they could live, what kind of education they're going to receive, if any at all, where they can go. You know, there's not a lot of freedom of choice. And you're still working primarily in cooperative bands. I mean, cooperation amongst the peasants and slaves to survive is crucial. Aristocracy, the history of the aristocracies is... This, you know, clan, people always talk about, oh, the clan, the oligarchs and all. Yeah, that's you can think of the oligarchy as simply our early tribal society translated into a hierarchical environment where you have these groups trying to, you know, maintain hold 
on the riches, you know, food, power, however conceptualized, right? Oh, we used to work together to harvest fruit and hunt deer. Now we work together to maintain slavery and keep our ports open because that's where our money comes from. So that transition changed a lot. I mean, a lot. I don't want to underestimate that in any way, but it didn't really free up identity yet. And so for thousands of years, millennia, humanity lived in environments, evolved socially and culturally into a certain, again, biologically in environments where the notion of individual expression, of uh, free will, of uh, self-exploration, of any question of identity was spurious. It, it didn't really arise. Even, you know, uh, Gilgamesh goes on this epic journey in the oldest tale that we have. And, and in Gilgamesh's time, there was one free person and it was Gilgamesh, right? So it was a society that had produced a single free person and he wanted to be immortal. He doesn't ever really stop to say, who am I? Except to say that I don't want to die. And then he discovers he's going to have to die. And so he's like, ah, crap, right? But it, so, so there is some self-introspection in, in, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, but not much. It's really pretty limited. It's, much, it's a great tale. I love the Epic of Gilgamesh. But, you know, even in much later, even in like the Odyssey or the Iliad, um, which a couple thousand years later, a thousand, at least a thousand years later in the oral tradition and, then of course, the written tradition later than that, one of the weird things is they don't struggle with identity. That's kind of, you would think there would be a lot more struggle with identity in there, but they seem pretty good with where everything is. They, you know, they're, it's not that sort of exploration in the way you would think it might be. Odysseus knows who he is and knows what he wants to do. And that's the question is, can I get it done? Uh, you know, his, his wife is wondering, is she, is he going to make it back? His son is wondering is, do I have a father and what should I do about that? But outside of that context, ah, it's just very limited amount of, uh, you know, concern with, um, stress with the identity. And when you go through these ancient texts, it occurs a little bit here and there. So I'm not saying it's never there. It's just pretty rare given the, you know, quantities that we have, of course, particularly as we get later. And then sometime, I mean, again, you know, you get a little bit in the Roman world because now you're getting big. You get some of the Chinese, classical Chinese texts, by the way, this comes up. Some of these introspective questions start to arise. You can think of Buddhism as maybe an early expression of this, of like, who are we? Who am I? What are we doing in the world? But again, limited to a very tiny elite uh, at the time. And then it starts to change. And we're living in the world, which I don't know where you want to pick the change, 1,500, 1,000, you know, when does it become wide scale? Say 1,500, just as a date, 1,500 AD. That world is at most, you know, what, 600 years old, 700 years old, 400 years old. Some people would say it's about 200 years old. So it's only in the last couple of hundred years at most that we've had as a core issue this question of identity. And so one reason I think we struggle with it, and I think we do, as we'll see in the later lectures, is for 200,000 years, despite the radical change of agriculture, yeah, we really didn't have to worry about it that much because we didn't have the opportunity or necessity of worrying about it. It's only now at the, whatever we are, late stages of the industrial revolution or the full flowering of the agricultural revolution, however you want to think about it, somewhere 1500, 1600, 1700, you pick a date, um, that this becomes a central problem for at first a, a few, but a growing number of people uh, until today where it becomes a central problem for most people. Most people today have to struggle with these questions because our culture, our societies have not evolved to deal with them. And the reason they haven't evolved to deal with them is because obviously they're so damn new. And that's what I want to leave you with tonight is this deep understanding and appreciation, if I've been articulate at all, that, you know, our structures have been identity, don't worry about it, that your, your culture, your society, your tribe, your group, 
took care of that for you. Not a question for you to ponder. And then, as we'll see, a few hundred years ago, this number of people who have to question this, who have to say, who am I? What am I doing? Why do I want to do it? Begins to grow. And it grows very rapidly until today we're faced with this monumental question of identity that was always solved. But to circle back to where I began with the primates, it's not a question of some sort of nice, you know, extra to life. We have to have a sense of identity to thrive, to be human, to be healthy, to be well. Just as chimps don't like to be isolated from their tribe, it's bad for them. Um, just as early hunter-gatherers would exile people, that was the ultimate punishment, maybe worse than being killed. Because then you lose everything. You lose your whole sense of, of being, of existence. To be exiled in most of the ancient world was this huge punishment. Socrates wouldn't stand for it, even though it would have saved his life. Other people did, but a lot of people wouldn't. Fast forward. Now that core feature is gone, has been stripped away. Our societies not only don't provide it for us, they feel that to provide people a sense of identity is, is probably bad. And so you have the opportunity, but now the problem of trying to fill in that gap. And I'll argue that our cultures and, and, and our in, in ourselves within our cultures, but our cultures generally have not really figured out how to address this problem that we've given people this opportunity to explore, express, develop a sense of who they are, and we have no idea what to do about that because our preceding 200,000 years of human cultural social evolution did nothing, absolutely zero, to prepare for it. We're prepared to live in small groups where we know who we are, we know who we are with for our entire lives, and we just don't live there anymore. So identity part two, the big change is coming in part three. Thank you very much.